So this morning we're continuing our series on the, the seven letters um, that's opened the book of Revelation. Uh, our series is called uh, Dear Church, um, and today we're going to, to look at the, the letter to uh, the church in a place called Smyrna. Um, and it's found in Revelation chapter 2, verses um, 8 to 11. So let's read um, what God has said to this church. The words will be up in the screen. So Revelation chapter 2, verses 8 to 11. And it says this. To the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and who came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever is ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your word. And if we're honest, Revelation is not necessarily a book that we all want to turn to because we read about crowns and horns and toes and beasts and kingdoms and it just gets so confusing and so difficult for us to understand. But Heavenly Father, we also want to recognize that the challenge for us as Christians is not the parts of Scripture that we don't understand, it's the parts that we do. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand this passage, this letter to this church. But we also pray that with that understanding that you would give us the desire, the willingness, the courage to put your word into practice in our lives. That where it challenges us, that we would not just say that you are Lord, but that we would submit to your Lordship. We pray, Heavenly Father, that your word would not be something that would make us fearful or something that we would shy away from, but we pray that through your spirit that we would embrace it, that we would let it be powerful and effective in our lives. So help us now to put everything else aside and to focus on what the spirit says to this church and to us as your people now. In Jesus' name, amen. Not in my notes, but I just want to say that a great philosopher once said, I love it when a plan comes together. Um, and it's been interesting that right, literally from the get-go this morning, from the first words um, that, um, that TJ used as a, 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 an encouragement to worship through the songs this morning, half my sermon's already preached. <laughs> Disappointing is it's not going to be any shorter. <laughs> but half my work's already done. So I want to begin at the end. And what I want us to think about is, what is this letter about? How do you sum up this letter? And so all I want to do is, I want to sum up this letter right now in three words. And to think about that as we go through this letter. Those three words are this, that we are to be faithful and not fearful. If you look at verse 10, which will be up on the screen, that's where this comes from. Jesus says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. And then he says later in, in the same verse, be faithful. Now, the bits I've missed out are the bits that are going to cause us problems today, right? Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer and be faithful even to the point of death. So, this letter is meant to be encouraging. But it's a letter that calls for courage in the midst of difficult circumstances. It's not just a letter that says, you know, go church, you know, I'm with you. It's a church that says, you're about to go through hard times. And I'm warning you in advance so it doesn't become a surprise to you. 
But I'm telling you, it will be hard, but don't give up. Be faithful, don't be fearful. And the reason why I was so, as, as a preacher, when you come to preach, the question is always in your mind, am I hearing from God correctly? Am I bringing the right word to God's people? And when TJ stands up and says that today we need to remember we are in the presence of a risen Savior, that he is alive and he rules and he reigns, that's the key to this letter, that we can be faithful, not fearful. If we simply look around us, that will bring fear. The minute we look up and we look to the one who has faced death and conquered it, the one who is alive forevermore, the one who rules and reigns now, that's where our faithfulness that overcomes fear comes from. So faithful, not fearful. That's what I want you to remember at the end of this message. And that's what I want you, when you read this letter from now on, to think about. Faithful, not fearful. So Smyrna. Smyrna itself is a port city 40 miles north of Ephesus, the, the subject of the first letter that, uh, that TJ read last week. But unlike that letter where while God commended the Ephesians for their acts of service, he condemned them for their loss of love. There's no condemnation, no criticism of this church at all. It's, only, it's one of only two of the seven letters where that happens, where God has no charge, no complaint against the church. And that probably explains the fact that Smyrna as a city still exists today. It's now called Izmir, and it's in western Turkey. So the city itself, unlike Ephesus, Ephesus is now just a collection of ruins, whereas 40 miles down the road, Smyrna, under a new name, still exists. And hopefully, just from that wee photograph you can see there, it looks like a lovely, beautiful city, and that actually becomes important to part of what this letter is about. The church that... Jesus addressed this letter to face two problems. One of them was a problem of the culture in which they lived, and the other problem they faced was a problem of the community in which they lived. So first of all, the culture. TJ last week pointed out that Ephesus was known for its worship of the, the goddess after uh, Aphrodite, I want to say. Diana is our, is our other name. Um, and they had this beautiful temple um, in Ephesus. Smyrna had a different reputation. It was a city that was known as a center for emperor worship, for worshiping the, the emperor, the ruler of the, the Roman Empire. So at the beginning of the first century, in, 20, uh, in, in AD 23, the, the, the city was given the, the honor over seven other cities of building a temple dedicated to the honor of the, the emperor Tiberius. Under the emperor Domitian, uh, who is probably the, the emperor who is ruling at this time just now when this letter has been written, Worshipping Caesar went from being optional to being compulsory. Every Roman citizen was ordered that once a year they had to burn incense on an altar and proclaim that Caesar is Lord. And when they did that, they were given a certificate to show they had done their duty towards the, the, the emperor. Failure to do that, Failure to be able to produce a certificate to say that you had worshipped the emperor was punishable by death. And Smyrna's devotion to the emperor is just one of many examples of how over the years this city was obsessed with showing its love and its obedience to the Roman Empire. So much so that the city itself was rewarded with the title of being the first of Asia or the first city of Asia. And so the opening words of this letter, these are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. They are a challenge to the pride of Smyrna. They, um, 
that they, Jesus wants to remind this church in Smyrna that he and he alone is the first. Not Caesar, not any city, not any other thing or thought, but he and he alone is first. And so the church was under pressure to bow down to this, the culture of its day and to worship the emperor. The second problem, as I said, is the community that they lived in. Smyrna had a large Jewish population. Judaism was what was called a protective religion under Roman law. That meant that its ceremonies, its sacrifices, its worship, its traditions could all be practiced throughout the empire without any fear um, of uh, persecution. But when you read the book of Acts in the New Testament, you can see that some Jews were not happy about this new group proclaiming that their Messiah had come and that not only had they not recognized him, but their leaders had actually put him to death. And so the fact that there were many Christians who weren't prepared to worship the emperor and to say that Caesar is Lord, that gave these people the perfect excuse to say, see these Christians, nothing to do with us. We're loyal to the emperor, but they're not. They're nothing but trouble. Verse 9 uh, describes this group of hostile Jews. Not all Jews, this specific group of hostile Jews is those who say they are Jews, but are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. But when Jesus before that says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, he's not just saying that I'm aware of what these people are saying against you or what these people are doing to you. He's reminding them that he's got first-hand experience of the same kind of persecution from the same kind of people. So in John chapter 8, we read that Jesus is in an argument with some of some of the Jews of his day. And they're very proud, they very proudly point out that they are good, faithful Jews. They observe the laws. And what they say is that we are the descendants of our father Abraham. And they kind of say to Jesus, but who you are, we have no idea. Jesus responds by saying, you're not actually children of your father Abraham. You are of your father the devil. You want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks his own nature because he is a liar and the father of lies. So when Jesus describes the persecutors of the church in this way, he's revealing where the true source of these attacks come from, that they come from Satan or from the devil. And so he says in verse 10, do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. The 10 days in Jewish culture is just a, a way of expressing the idea that it will be for a, a short while, an indefinite length of, of time, but a definite, it will not last forever, but we don't know how long it will be. Either way, Jesus wants to encourage them that the persecution that they are going through, the persecution that they are about to experience, at some point will come to an end. But he also wants to warn them that things will also get worse before they get better. And as I pointed out in verse 10, when it says that we are to be faithful, not fearful, it's like Jesus says, now the heat's going to get turned up because you are to be faithful even to the point of death. And then as a promise, I will give you your life as a victor's crown. And just as this letter began with words which were a challenge to, the, to the, the pride of Smyrna, I am the first and the last. So these opening words also have an encouragement for the church in Smyrna because he says that I am the one who died and came to life again. And so when Jesus says, be faithful, even to the point of death. He wants to remind them that he's not asking them to do anything that he himself has not already been prepared 
to do. That despite the opposition and the attacks that he faced from the same kind of people, he literally was obedient to God even to death, the Bible says, even to death on a cross. And again, the same passage that many will be familiar with says, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, not that Caesar is Lord, but that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. And so Jesus makes the same promise. If you follow me all the way in the same way that I have, just as I have overcome death and just as I, and just as I have come out the other side victorious, you will do the same. He asked them not to focus on this life, but to focus on the life to come where, we, where they will share Christ's victory over sin, over Satan, and even over death itself. And he repeats that promise. Not only does he say that if you are faithful even to the point of death, I will give you life, not just your life. I will give you life, eternal life life in all its fullness. He repeats the promise, and the letter ends with the words, the one who is victorious will not be hurt by the second death. Now, just to explain that very, very quickly, the Bible talks about two kinds of death. There is the physical death that we have talked about today, and we've prayed for a family that, who have lost their, their dad and who are experiencing that just now. That is the death that all of us will, unless the Lord comes back, that's the death that all of us one day will probably experience. But the Bible talks about a second death, where, he, where it talks about a separation from God for all eternity. And that is a phrase that turns up in the book of Revelation that talks about the second death, when Satan and all those who have not served God, it says, are cast into a lake of fire. That is the second death. And so here's a promise. That if we are faithful and not fearful, if we trust in him who has faced death and conquered it, if we trust him who has overcome and who reigns victorious, we will never see that second death because Christ has died so that we will never experience it, that we will never be separated from our heavenly father. And so Jesus can say to those who are faithful and not fearful, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, first death, will live. End of. So here's a really confusing letter. I said to you at the beginning, it's meant to be encouraging, and yet it's talking about persecution, and it's talking about imprisonment, and it's talking about death. How is this an encouraging letter? How do we apply what Jesus has said to a first century church in Asia to a 21st century church in Glasgow? Well, let's start with the obvious one. We can say this doesn't actually mean anything to us because we are not going through persecution. Well, don't question it. Give thanks. That we have this fortunate situation of we have freedom as Christians to come together. We've literally got our doors open. We're not got them barred. We're not meeting in secret. We're not singing quietly and meekly in case anybody hears us. We're singing out. We are proclaiming who Jesus is. We are sharing who Jesus is with people. So, Let's give thanks for the freedom that we enjoy and just and not simply take it for granted. Secondly, let's make use of that freedom. While we can, let's preach the good news about who Jesus is. Let's challenge the culture and the community that we're in. To tell them who Jesus is, because so many of them haven't a clue. Jesus is just the name that they use to swear when something goes wrong or something happens. And we need to remind them how lovely, how important, how great that name is. 
Let's give thanks that a couple of weeks ago, we could have an entire week when we could share Jesus with people of all ages, from children up to adults. Nobody batted an eyelid. We also want to pray that people's lives and hearts were changed. So let's give thanks for the freedom that we have and let's use that freedom. But let's also use that freedom on behalf of those who don't have it. Because we know that our situation is very different from our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world. And it's not that far away. In fact, when I think about it, there are people who have come to this church in order to escape the persecution that they were facing at home. So, Let's remember those who are facing the very things that this, le this letter speaks about. It's not some distant thing from 2,000 years ago. This is the reality for our brothers and sisters today. That they are. A I think the worst I've ever faced as a Christian is being called a few names, which makes me laugh now. I really don't mind being called a Bible thumb or a Jesus freak or anything else. What are off a duck's back? But for many of our brothers and sisters... The abuse goes beyond being verbal. It is physical. It's more than just words. It is being ostracized from your family or from your community. It's been denied jobs. It's been denied education. It's been denied health care and employment and so many other things. And it goes beyond that. And there are our brothers and sisters today who are in prison because they stand up for Jesus. There are our brothers and sisters today who are being tortured because they will not bow the knee to the community or to the culture because they insist on being faithful and not bowing down to fear. And they need to know that we are not forgetting them. So I want to encourage you today, if you're not already, there are so many organizations out there that can give you information and it's organizations like the voice of the martyrs barnabas fund open doors release international just to name a few that can give us specific people specific situations that we can be praying for that we can be not we can be giving our time we can be giving financially to support the work that they are doing put pressure on your mps and your MSPs, and anybody else that you can think of, so that they're aware of what's going on in the world. Because you never hear this in the news. It's a forgotten persecution. It's largely ignored by the world. So put pressure on people so that believers might know that we have not forgotten them, that we are so... We are, are, are just so comfortable in our own situation that we forget what they, they are going through for the sake of Christ. Third thing, though, is not to be complacent. For the first time, this was released in, uh, in the news a couple of weeks ago, for the first time um, since they were conducted, the, the 2022 census shows that in Scotland and in England and Wales, the, the number of people who profess some kind of Christian faith. And some of that might be really, really tenuous, but the number of people who have professed some kind of Christian faith has dropped below 50%. It literally is sitting at 49%. It's not a big drop, but it's what that signifies because those figures have been dropping for decades now. And it shows every time the census comes out and the number of people who profess some kind of faith, Christian faith, as those numbers drop, what that shows is that we are living in a culture, in a community that is moving further and further and further away from who Jesus is and from the truths that we as his followers stand on. And... We already live in a community where, in so many issues, to question the wisdom of the day, to question the gods and the beliefs 
of the day on things like relationships, sexuality, gender, marriage, results in a storm of abuse and sanction. We call it cancel culture. The Bible calls it persecution because that's what it is. We supposedly live in an open, inclusive, and accepting society until you disagree with that open and loving and accepting society and you will find it to be anything but. As long as you're prepared to bow the knee and say Caesar is Lord, the community and the culture will accept you. The minute you stand up and you say, no, Jesus is Lord. I believe in his word and in his truth culture and community will clash with you and clash with you hard. What I do want to remind you is fourthly is this, and that is that Jesus takes the persecution of his people very, very personally. When we're going through the letter to Ephesians, uh, we were reminded that Jesus and his church, the bride of Christ, are so, closely relinked, are so closely connected that they're almost inseparable. And so there's this fantastic story, in, in, again, in the book of Acts. We know the story of Saul, one of those Jews who went after the church and persecuted it. And it says that he went from house to house looking for believers with letters authorizing them, him to put them in prison. And as he was on his way um, from Jerusalem, with his letters of power to a city called Damascus, he has an encounter with the risen Jesus. And there's this fantastic verse in Acts chapter 9, verses 4 and 5 says this, Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, Who are you, Lord? Saul, and, and the reply was, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You touch the church, you touch Jesus. It's as simple as that. That to attack the church is to attack God himself and is an offense to God. And so here, is a, here for us as an encouragement, here is a warning that God will not let that slip. God will not ignore that. God in his grace and we have this problem about pain and suffering and everything else. Why does God allow? God in his grace is allowing the church to be persecuted that as we are faithful and not fearful, we are a witness to the world of who Christ is so that the very people who are attacking us can be saved, that they will not face the second death. But God says, if you touch the church, you're touching me. And so, again, in Revelation, just a few chapters on from where we are, there's a fantastic vision of heaven, the throne room of God, and it says that in that throne room, underneath the throne of God are those who have given their life for the church, and it says that they cry out to Christ for justice. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10 says this, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. We are called to be faithful and not fearful because for a little while, compared to the vastness of eternity, that what we go through now is a little while. It is 10 days. In a little while, persecution and suffering will cease and God will judge those responsible. And I don't say that in a self-righteous way of wanting condemnation and judgment on those who are not believers. I want to remind you what I said a minute ago. God has been gracious, and even if it means that Christ died for our sins, and even if that means that as we as his church have to suffer in order to bring people to faith, God considers out of his love and mercy that that's a sacrifice worth paying. It's a sacrifice that he asks us to be prepared to pay, that people might come to faith. But there is a point will come when God will say, enough is enough. And 
persecution will come at an end, will come to an end, but it will come at a cost to those responsible for it. So how can we respond to this letter today? There's a number of things. First of all, by coming to this communion table and appreciating, again, the freedom that we have to be able to do that. Come to this table today and, to, and say that Jesus is Lord, that no one else and nothing else is more important. Nothing else is first in my life. Come to this table today and remember that it is not just simply a memorial to a fallen hero, but it's a proclamation of a risen Savior. That we are called to celebrate Christ's death until he comes. Dead people don't come back. Alive people, living people come back. And therefore, when we take this table, when we take this bread and wine, we are reminding ourselves that we share in his victory over sin, over death, over Satan, that we share his victory over every persecutor, every situation, every circumstance that Satan might use to try to make us fearful and not faithful. And so with all that this morning, my last response to this is to ask if you have accepted Christ into your life, whether you're here today or whether you're watching online. This message with its warnings about persecution and suffering for being a follower of Christ might seem like a strange one to include an invitation to come to Jesus, to put your trust in him, to set aside your own will and to follow him. But actually, it's the perfect message to invite people to come to Christ. Too often, a call to become a Christian can sound like some empty and false promise. Come to Jesus and all your problems will go away. I think I can safely say this morning that no one can accuse me of saying that today. But then somebody might say, well, Andrew, why would I want to become a Christian if it just comes with a whole new set? problems and to that question I need to point out that you've missed the point of this message that we can be faithful and not fearful because of the one who died for our sins that we can be fearful and not fa that we can be faithful and not fearful because of the one who came back to life again not just to offer us forgiveness but to offer us eternal life there is no one and there is nothing in this world that can give us that kind of life. So that is why today the call is that we should be a people who are, who are faithful and not fearful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that just as John saw you standing in the midst of seven golden lampstands and holding seven stars, we thank you that you are present here today, that you are alive and that you are alive forevermore. We thank you that you don't just tell us to keep going, to battle on. We thank you that you remind us that you yourself have faced everything that you ask us to face and that you have overcome. And so therefore, that's our guarantee. We were singing earlier on, Heavenly Father, that we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we pray this week that that would be true, that we would be bold and courageous, that we would use the freedom that we have to share with other people the reason for the hope that we have, that we would be blessed and have the honor of being used by you to bring other people to faith in you, Heavenly Father. Help us this week, regardless of whether we face persecution, whether we are simply ignored, help us to put our faith, our trust in you and help us not to give up, but to trust in you until the day comes when we stand before you, when we hear the words from you ourselves, well done, good and faithful servant. And so we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.